I'm happy to meet you all again after so many years. It's a quite a, renewal, a renewed moment for me. Um, I was invited to come and tell some stories about maybe my early days and my family. And I've made a few pages of notes here and I've got 30 minutes, okay. <laughs> um, first thing you, you apparently heard about my, cat, my museum. So I'd like to pass it around. This is the catalog. It's five generations of the family. And if you happen to live in an old Victoria house full of artifacts and, and um, memorabilia, this is one way to preserve it for at least one more generation. That was my purpose. Uh, I've also written, again, family history based on my father's research and 40 years of my time. And I'll hand this volume one out, just to look at a couple of things. On the front it says, if you go to Google the gene pool, the Ginn family of Canada, you have a copy of the catalog, you have a copy of the book. And another interesting story about George Washington, who's part of my family. And I'll just refer you to the paper clip. My most recent discovery was I've located us in the Doomsday Book or Domesday Book, which is the uh, census of England for 1086. And it was really an inventory of property, land, who owned it as well as the people. And so if your name's in there, that's an invite to aristocracy. So um, pass that around and, and the paper clip is there with a little note in it. Thanks. Next, I'd like to introduce you to a couple of my relatives. James Ross Haig, born 18, uh, 45, uh, Greenock, Scotland, marine engineer, my maternal great-grandfather. You're aware of uh, Henry Morton Stanley's famous meeting with David Livingston, and then he traveled down the Congo River and saw a huge opportunity with the help of the King of Belgium. He created the Congo Free State. He had 11 boats on the Congo River, nine of them with steam engines. He needed steam engineers. One was James Ross Haig. And in the catalog, you'll see a picture of his compass and also his laptop. And I'm not going to waste time on the word right now, but we may get to that later. Um, my paternal great-grandfather, Diogo Madison Gen, born in Olinda, Brazil, same year, 1845. Um, in 1850, the English were run out of Brazil and he and his father went back to England. His um, Portuguese mother and the other brother stayed there. In my travels, I, after 140 years, I've put the two pieces of the family back together. I have Diogo's passport and his 1874 diary. And I was so intrigued by it, I, I knew a um, handwriting analyst I met on a cruise ship. So I sent it to her and say, what can you tell us? And she wrote four long pages about, about um, Diogo. And I've got four children. I handed it to the eldest one and he read it. And he said, dad, this is you. And I passed it to the second one eventually. And he said, dad, this is you. And the other two said the same thing. So that's kind of a curious 
um, discovery. Um, Diogo died at age 32 and fathered six children. Four of them made it to Victoria in the, about 1880. Uh, the eldest, Emily, that's her family out in the yard. I can talk about that later. Uh, the, she brought her little, little brother. She came out to Victoria in um, domestic service, look after some family, brought her little brother. Um, Reginald was the next one to arrive on a, he was around the Horn twice on once on the Nith and once on the Riverside. Jump ship and in San Francisco came overland and caught up to his sister. So he got established in Victoria and that put three and there's one other sister, Bertha, and I'm not going to talk about her, but she is in the book. And what I did write the story in the book, I just gathered the newspaper clippings, put them in date order, and typed them. So if you can find that story, you might find some amusement in it. Um, Diogo's cousin. Royal Navy Sub-Lieutenant Edward Hawke Ginn, 1865 on Esquimalt Station, 1867 on the steamship Beaver. I don't have to discuss the Beaver, you know that one. It was in, it, Beaver, well first of all it it saved the Pacific coast for for Canada. I can ex explain that sometime. Uh, it was in passenger service, reconfigured. It went into survey service. It, uh, and Sub Lieutenant Edward was the midshipman doing the recording of the sur of the survey. And so. Captain Pender was running out of names for all the islands and things he had to put on the map. And so that's how Ginn Island got named. Captain Walbrand's book, Place Names, tells a story about him and how he went out to Calcutta, got the cholera, and died a couple of months later. I have pictures of him, pictures of his grave, and the that's the whole story is in the book. Um, that's not the end of the story about naming that island. In 1897, my grandfather, son of Diogo, Reginald, decided to go to the gold rush, got a two Norwegians for partners, went to Seattle, bought a sailboat, to take a sailboat on the open ocean, you better ballast it, fill it full of rocks. But they didn't. They bought $300 worth of potatoes, filled the hull of the boat with potatoes, and sold it for enough money in Skagway to pay for the boat. Uh, Reginald I knew well, next door neighbor, Cadova Bay, Parker Avenue, and he was full of stories. And my cousin Robert and I lived side by side. You've probably heard of Robert Ginn, the artist. And Reginald told us his life stories. And he claimed that when he sailed up past the mouth of the Skeena, ran the sailboat on sandbar at low tide, had to wait so many hours to float it, went ashore, to hunt meat for the boat. And in the process, squared a tree with his ax, which was probably for the butchering, got his indelible pencil and wrote again on the four sides. 
And his claim was that's how the island was named Gen Island. Well, we got two stories completely opposite. And after 70 years of hearing them, I um, decided to try and figure out the puzzle. One of them had to be true. Both of them couldn't be true. But as it turned out, they were both true. Um, I sent, first of all, sent Robert up in his yacht to, to inspect Gen Island. And he came back and said, it's just shrub and driftwood. There's not a, enough ground there to support a herd deer. Start over, he said. So I got a 1911 chart of the area of the mouth of Esquina, and I got the hand lens, and I started walking all the islands, all the shores with the hand lens. And what I discovered on Stewart Island, a big island, was a new navigational light, and it was located on Marked Tree Bluff. So that's the tree. Twelve years after he marked it, it ended up on the chart. Okay. Emily, the eldest sister, she married Arthur Lewis. And they went up to Bennett Lake, the headwaters of the uh, Yukon River, the head of navigation, and they operated the trading post. And 1918, well, the Yukon shuts down about the end of September, and, and the people that have a place to go get on a boat and leave. So it just about deserts the, the whole area. So Arthur Lewis was on the um, Sophia, and they were coming down towards Vanderbilt Reef, and the ship went on the reef. So they didn't take the people off. They thought they'd be safer on the ship. And two days later, the wind changed. The ship did a 180 and fell into deep water, it took 360 people, no survivors. And that's the biggest disaster on the, on the Pacific coast and its impact on the Yukon um, makes the t t Titanic look pretty minimal. Um, so, Emily, Lewis, um, Harold, her son, Nora, her daughter, are, we just found the headstone out here, Peter showed, okay. reminding me where it was. So when Nora died, the da youngest daughter, the last of the line, um, Nora never had to work in, worked in the Bank of Montreal to support her mother because there's no, no breadwinner anymore. So she didn't marry, so there was no further def children. And when she died, Uncle Doug again phoned me up and said, well, Nora has passed on. She was well in, in her 90s. And I said to him, did you get the Bible? He says, no, where is it? I said, in your middle dresser drawer. He says, I'll call you right back. So he called back in an hour, and he says, yes, I've got the Bible. Now, in the museum, there's about 20 Bibles, just for a collection. But in the information in the front, there's a lot of good stuff. And so that's... Um, oh, and the other thing I said to him, oh, he said, uh, there's not enough room on the stone for Nora's name. Should I get another stone, a brass plaque? He says, this is your department, what do I do? I said, 
get a new stone and start over. And while you're at it, correct the spelling of Emily's middle name. It has to match your birth certificate. So that got fixed. Yep, 10. Um, one of the museum artifacts is a boat cushion. Red velvet, not quite as big as this. And my mother had it. Oh, where did you get it? From your grandfather. Well, what is it? Well, it's a boat cushion out of Robert Louis Stevenson's boat. And I said, well, how do you know? Well, your grandfather told me. So that kind of floated around. I have it. And that kind of floated around until uh, five years ago, I decided to better work on that one. And so um, I found out, oh, I guess I was reading the Vagabond Fleet, the story of the Victoria Sailing Company and all their boats, filled them full of Indians and sent them up the Plea Roths to slaughter the herd. But before they left, they took the vel they took all the fancy curtains and cushions out and um, stripped it down and turned it into a fishing boat. And um, the Victoria Sealing Company now owned the boat. And if you go to another file, Reginald Ginn's Sealing Company file, he was managing secretary and I have a signature on documents and share certificates and that's how he got the velvet cushion probably locked it up in the washroom brought it home okay that's what goes into writing these family histories um, Joseph Austin Sayward Sayward Building, Sayward Beach, Sayward Road. The richest man in British Columbia, presumably. And his build, he built the Sayward Building at that view in Douglas. And again, a state accounting firm. My grandfather and my father was the top floor, floor six. That was Sayward's registered office for his companies. Um, he had owned the mills that cut the lumber that built Victoria. Have you heard of Mill Bay? That's his biggest mill. And so he died in 1934 and in 1935 my grandfather built his home on the first lot on Sayward land. Cut some pieces off for Uncle Doug to build and my father to build. So that's the land that we have our home, had our home on, Sayward Beach. Um, in the museum, you'll see a picture of a, about a one-ton safe. Beautiful thing, all painted and ornated. Combination, clank, inner doors, clunk. And J.A. Sayward painted across the top. That's Joe Sayward's safe. And there's hardly a day that I don't put something in or take something out. So that's in the museum. But really, what I really wanted to do was talk about the war stories. I was born in 37 and the war started in 39, I guess. And so I lived my childhood through the first years. But my father was the deputy controller for civil defense. And everywhere he went, I went. So I got to be the assistant deputy controller. Okay? And. One of our first adventures as uh, me as the assistant to the deputy controller. Um, 
phone call one day. This is heavy. Um, phone call one day. Somebody dropped a bomb on one of our neighbor's house. And so we attended. It was just the house, four, four houses down from McMorrin's. You probably know where McMorrin's is. And this bomb had come through the roof. It hit the drain board. Shh, Mrs. Bainbridge, I guess it was, was washing dishes that went through the drain board and out the wall beside the door. So we were there. And we were the closest. And the others showed up. Uh, uh, Chief Law of the Fire Department. Enid's great, Enid's grandfather by marriage, Josiah Bull, was there. And, oh, have you ever seen a bomb? Do you know what a bomb looks like? Anybody not seen a bomb? This is what they dropped. Not this one. This is just a uh, this is just a civil defense training bomb. There's nothing in it, but this is what they use for practice. Okay. And we had a bombing target off Cowich and Head, north end of Sayward Beach, and another one kind of at the foot of of Mount Douglas and the. Hanley Page Hamptons would come in and bomb these targets. Well, this Hanley Page Hampton, you know him, <laughs> he's, he's my partner in this one, um, started dropping bombs, came over Beaver Lake and got to the Halliburton area, and Jones was the pilot's name. He started dumping his bombs. And he hit a house up next to Peter. And um, we both rode our little, well, Jack um, Knox, the columnist, did a very short blurb on this event. Peter saw it, I saw it, we each wrote our story. And then he put it all together and did a one page on this. I'm, uh, was it, what was the fellow's name that yeah. Um, Peter's comment in the paper was, uh, it didn't seem to bother him too much. He was born most of the time anyway. You remember that? <laughs> I have the article. I didn't make that up. And so I'm standing there. I, I'm five-ish. I guess I'm five years old with the chief, the fire chief and the police chief and my father. And they're asking Mrs. Bainbridge. Well, the plate got broken. Well, did you drop the plate or did the bomb hit the plate? And I thought this is a bit boring. So I said to my dad, I'll see you back at the station. And I don't quite know how I pulled this off, but I walked out, got in the Sanix patrol car, passenger seat, and the officer says, where do we want to go? Oh, let's go back to the station. So we were heading back to the station. I mean, you wouldn't do that now, but that's apparently these guys were supposed to be looking after me anyway. I said, can I use the microphone? Yeah, he says, you want to tell the story on the bomb? Yeah, sure, here, he gives me the mic, turns it on. So I broadcast the news about this bombing uh, for the first time. Um, So that was a Hanley Page Hampton. And it was uh, the only bomber we had at the time and it carried three people and it wasn't wide enough to sit by, side by side. It was this wide, I've been in one. So there was a pilot and a navigator and a bombardier and that's how we went to war with those things. The next encounter we're at Cordova Bay, and it must have been earlier midsummer, and my father's 30-foot boat was hauled out of the water for painting the bottom. 
haul it out at high tide. You got till 12 hours to paint it and put it back in the water. So he's painting and I'm down at the edge of the water um, playing in the sand, I suppose. And I walked up and said to my dad, what, there's Hamptons, the squadron of Hamptons coming over the islands, which meant the American islands. And a squadron is six, always six planes. So I went and told him, and he grunted. Well, in my family, a grunt means yes and a groan means no. So I went back to play. I was back in a few minutes. <clears throat> Dad, one of those Hamptons has, a, has an engine problem. Trouble, I, that was my word. So he put down the brush and walked down. And I, out of six engines, there's two on each plane, I, and I hadn't seen them yet, they're still too far away. I had picked a bad engine. So he said, let's go up on the rocks and see what happens. So we went up where we could see and we're looking at the end of James Island. Now there's five dots showed up, one missing. He was a mile behind, a thousand feet below, so we watched him and he hit the water just off the end of James Island. Um, so, um, my dad says, um, will you stay here and take charge? I'll go phone this in. And there's not much I could do about that. But anyway, given the exact location, 9.15 in the evening, and the tide chart, so they could map where, you got 30 seconds to ditch in Hampton. There's a life raft and there's three people. So if they got out, they would be heading out to sea on this ebb tide. They picked them up at three in the morning off Ten Mile Point. So that's the Hamptons. But the next one, I was on my own. Same setting, down by the shore, Saturday afternoon. And there was a huge roar came over the trees. I would have said it like, now I'd say it was like a Harley Davidson with a throttle wide open. And this plane just came over my head and hit the water uh, at zero rock, which is before you get to Darcy Island. And I saw it go in the water and I watched for a bit. And then I saw the parachute. So I went up to, ran up the stairs, the, and the phone is a wooden box, like this. And there's the secret air sea rescue number on the phone. So I told the operator to give me that number, and the fellow answered. I said, there's a, a fighter plane just went in the water at zero rock. He said, okay, I'll get somebody out there. Strand, I'll send a strand here. Thank me very much, and I went down to watch the rescue. And then, here comes the Princess Elizabeth around Gordon Head Point. So I said to myself, he probably doesn't know about that. Up the stairs again, right up. Got on the line again, and I said, Elizabeth is two miles south of the crash site. So he said, thanks, I'll give her a call. So I went down to watch. Elizabeth comes up, stops, drops a lifeboat. That's a, what happened next is too far away to see. So that's how they got that fella back. Some other war stories that um, I wasn't really part of, uh, but Uncle George was in World War I and World War II. I have his, from World War I, I have, I have, I got his tin hat from World War II and his gas mask. Well, my house gas mask training was every Sunday morning at 10. You know, people don't believe that we had to have gas masks. Um,
we, our house it was blackout. We were visible from the ocean. So all the outside windows were covered with cardboard. There was a 110 watt bulb we were allowed in the house. The car my dad could drive because he was official, but the light headlights were covered and there was a slot about this big just to drive by. Uncle George, World War I, I got his, his pay book and his discharge papers. He went overseas with the Canadian Expeditionary Force at the age of 12. I have the documents. He was a bugler. And I don't know why the Army needs music, but that wasn't the purpose of the bugle. You see, there was no radios and no other communication, but you could have 3,000 troops camped out in the forest and the generals would get together, we're going to advance tomorrow at 6 o'clock, George, go and blow that. So he would send the messages out with his bugle. Could you imagine what would happen if a 12-year-old if a got, got retreat to advance instead? Anyway. Um, James Ireland. Do you remember that the the, uh, the explosion? Anybody remember that? I was in about grade five at Cordova Bay School, so this would be 1947 or 48, 47, I guess, for its first year. And we're sitting there minding our business or doing something. And all of a sudden, there was a huge explosion that just shook the air. And then we looked out the window, and here's a great ball of black smoke rising. And everybody looked at me in the direction the smoke was at, right on line with my house. And I was known to have a chemistry set. And that was the talk around the classroom. You just blew your house up. <laughs> but that wasn't entirely true. Um, CIL's munitions plant on James Island. It was set up each building. The buildings were separate and the natural forest retained between them. A mishap in one wouldn't necessarily take out the whole industry. So the newspaper reported the explosion Two fellas burning garbage on the beach. There was explosives in the garbage and both of them were killed. That's what we were led to believe. And years later, I worked in the Forest Service with Bob Carpenter. He was my age. He lived on the island. One entire plant was leveled, 28 people killed, but never reported. So that's another of my wartime stories. Uh, do, you, um, do you remember Mr. Murphy, the phys ed teacher? A few smiles and a few scowls, yeah. <laughs> um, his wife, did you know his wife? And she introduced herself, you know Mr. Murphy, I'm Mrs. Murphy. And she used to talk to me, and she told me about her time at Esteban Point at the lighthouse. She was staying there. She had a one-year-old child with her, and that was the night the submarines opened fire on the lighthouse. And the lighthouse keeper climbed the 110-foot tower of the lighthouse and switched off the light. The submarines went home. But the nearest to a direct hit was seven feet from the front door. That's her story. Um, there's a story about a, another boat that was torpedoed. I thought it was the Camosun, but I did some checking the other night, and it was the SS Fort Camosun, a freighter. And it was a wooden boat, 
and it was full of plywood headed for England. It's maiden voyage out of Victoria. And it got out of the harbour and somewhere down the channel and the subs hit it. So it started to sink, so they abandoned ship. But it wouldn't sink. It was full of plywood. My guess is that plywood was going to was our marine plywood that was going to be building mosquito bombers. Um, so anyway, they towed it ashore and uh, pump and pumped it out, patched it up, went back into service. It was turned into a troop ship. It was on the Mediterranean when the Italians torpedoed it, but it wouldn't sink. So they hauled it ashore somewhere and patched it all up and were back in service. The third time the Germans hit it with a bomb, blew it to pieces. Blackouts for submarines I told you about, gas mask. How many of you ever seen a, a, a Japanese balloon? Do you remember? The Japanese were building, making these balloons with baskets of stuff, whatever, and they were releasing them and they were coming over mostly our coast. Anyway, the one that was captured was hidden away in a special room at the airport, and being as I was the deputy, the assistant of the deputy controller, I got to go and have a look at it. And the balloon was really quite large, and the, it carried a basket all tied together out of bamboo. And on the basket, on the rim of it, were hooks. And ballast weights were hung on the hooks on different lengths of string. And if it got too close to the water or the ground, one of those would touch and unhook itself. And up it would go again. And the last thing, the last thing to, to, to drop would have been whatever it was delivering. And it was much, it wasn't that dangerous, I guess, other than the possibility of germ warfare. Uh, but it was psychologically devastating to know that the jumps were flying over our heads. That story, I guess it hasn't been really told. Um, VE Day, May 7th. Victory Europe Day was announced on the 7th, but it wasn't signed until the 8th. And VJ Day was announced on the 10th of August, and it wasn't signed until the 14th. May 7th is my brother's birthday. August 10th is my birthday. I did grade one, and my father did grade one at the one-room school, Royal Oak, not at the same time. Uh, um, what happened to Kenny Polson? He's what? The first day of grade one, on the bottom step to that school, over on the right hand side we sat side by side and cried our hearts out. Um, I graduated from Royal Oak High School in 54, UBC, six, UBC 62. Um, just a couple of little quips from years since. Um, Saturday, I, Traveled with my father wherever he went, and Saturday he had a lot of clients in the 100 age that had to be take care of their money and their whatever their things, and I would go with them. And on the way home, we would stop at Number One Fire Hall. I think it's still there, is it? The old fire hall on Douglas Street with the tower. Do you know what the tower is for? Most people don't know why a fire hall has a tower. If you're using natural cotton hoses, you've got to dry them. Yeah. 
That's, I'm glad somebody knew that one. Um, anyway, we would stop at the fire hall, visit with the firemen. My father, I have his fireman's badge from 1922. And um, there was only one engine in the hall. So, and there were two firemen in the hall. So we sat in the office and talked for a while. Fire here and a fire there and everybody's out. But we're left with one fire engine, the two of us. So we had a good visit. And then the phone rang. So the two guys jumped up and said, we got to go. Would you take the calls? Just def defer them to number three. <sighs> OK, so we sat there. The phone rang again. And I hear my dad saying, sorry, I can't give that information out. No, I cannot tell you where the fire is. We don't, we want to keep the crowds away and whatever. And I could hear the, uh, the reply after so many minutes and I could hear what was said. Ken, is that you? My father. This was Chief Law wanting to know one where all his firemen were in the trucks. And he wanted to know why we are in his fire hall. So we got that sorted out. And then there's another story he told me. He was on his way to work, um, Bling and Sock Road, to go to his office one morning. And he noticed on the side of the road that the grass was a bit trampled. And it hadn't been trampled the day before. So he stopped and got out, walked in the bush. And here's a safe. So he went, got to his office and he phoned Enid's grandfather by marriage, um, Chief Josiah Bull. Hmm? Yeah, okay. And said, have you had any robberies over the night? No, none that were been reported. Well, if you're missing the safe, I'll tell you where it is. And Chief Joe says, Ken, how come you're out there every morning solving our crimes before we heard of them? They were good buddies. Anyway, that's about the end of my story for now. Don't you have stories from school? From school. Uh, not that I want to talk about. <laughs> Yeah. They're the best kind. <laughs> well, maybe next time. No, I don't have much, much recollection in public school. I was pretty much on my own, small for my age, and I was in grade three at the age of six. So, thank you very much. Yeah. Yes, you talked about the name again in the Tuesday book. Yes. yes. I got that one just a couple of months ago. I just found uh, something on the internet, a report that somebody had written on something about it, and I read it. It referred to the Gens of Anjo, French, France, now in Yorkshire, and I said, that's us. I took it right off an article and copied that little bleb word for word. Um, I started writing, well, I guess I inherited um, my father's collection of artifacts and letters and re all the stuff from every time somebody passed on in the family, he dedicated a shoebox to him. Not for the ashes, for the papers, the letters, the wallet, the photographs. And he saved all that stuff, but he didn't know what to do with it. So in about 80, 82, I think he died, and I inherited the, a truckload of stuff. Gave it to my cousin Robert, 
and he brought it back and said, this is really good stuff. You better do something about it. And he left. <laughs> so I did. I started writing on my Commodore uh, A drive, B drive, Multimate. Two fingers. I can type two fingers because that's as fast as I can think. Okay? It works perfect for me. Um, so I wrote something. My name is Dave again. I was born in a, I was very small then. And I couldn't think of what else to say. Well, genealogy, every time you answer a question, you automatically create two more. It's endless. So obviously when I wrote that, I got a mother and a father. And that's how it started. Are we done? Um, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 40, no, 43, I guess. Okay. Oh, we wrote in pencil in the mornings. Do you remember that? You had to put the ink on the stove to thaw it out. <laughs> well, that's what we did. Okay. We done? Whoop. <laughs> the only time this ever did any damage, it was on the mantelpiece and it fell off and made a big dent in the hardwood floor. David, the question was, what about your museum? Oh. Well, yes. Nobody in my family wants it. Everybody's downsizing, decorating modern. And I'd like you to give some thought to what we could do with it. I have uh, Caroline Dawson's been out to visit, had lunch and studied it. Saanich has no place to put it. Um, Valerie Green that writes the books of Victoria. She's been out for lunch. She's supplied me with stuff about my family that I put into mine. And I go to her book signings. And she, she's a member of the Saanich Historical Society. Um, the archive, uh, Caroline said, this is too big for Saanich. I want to refer you to the Royal BC Museum. And so, I forget his name, the archivist came out. I had, as a door prize for him, a carton of stuff about the Pierce family and other things for his museum that I really shouldn't have, including uh, uh, the Bible that Bishop I think it was Crick, gave to Sarah Jane Pierce and, and um, her husband Pierce uh, as a wedding gift all inscribed. I had all this stuff left over from the family collection. And so he referred it to the curator. He didn't show up, but I talked to him and he looked at the catalog and said, well, this stuff wasn't made in British Columbia. We don't do anything with it. So I've come to a dead end on it. And um, if some of you want to come out, well, the address is, I'll move on here. Um, so if somebody wants to come out to look at the museum, we're there all the time. And um, let us know and we'll be sure to be home. You're going to stay for refreshments and stuff? Yeah. So if you want to make arrangements to visit David's museum, he's going to stay for refreshments and you can talk to him during the refreshment break, okay? Yep.
Thank you, David. Thank you so much.